Fleet Street was a village. Everybody knew everybody else. Every night was party night. Fleet Street was a, a buzzing kind of place, you know, you could imagine. There's 100,000 people work 24 hours a day, really. There was the, uh, the Daily Telegraph, the Daily Express, all had beautiful offices and a facade of uh, real places to be proud of. But uh, behind that, they were just like factories. In the part of London that I was brought up in, for working class boys, apologies for girls, but girls were expected to be housewives, um, there was only two jobs. One was docking and the other one was printing. These were the jobs where there was money. And my family was all in the print and it was automatic then that you just followed the family generation. My father, was born in 1909 and had never really had a trade and he'd had a very hard life. He was an ash felter as well and where they all used to crowd round calling for work in the morning and workers was picked out, the governor used to stand up there and say, I'll have you, you, you. My dad was very small and they used to pass him over so he wasn't getting any work at all then he was determined that I should have a trade and a proper trade to earn a living. And I had family within the printing industry. Some of them were in the docks, some of them were in the print. So obviously being a woman at that point in time, you couldn't go in the docks, so I went in the printing industry. I went into the print from the dole. They sent me to a firm called Gestetners, which doesn't exist anymore. But they used to make duplicating machines, which also don't exist anymore. So that's the first job I had in the print, was working in Tottenham and Gestetners. I was made redundant from an aeroplane engine company at 15, and the next option, which was actually a better job as it turned out, was the print, to be a compositor. Number one, the money was good. That was the most important thing. I was uh, a diabetic by the time I was seven, and I wanted to follow my father into his job at Covent Garden Market as a porter. But my doctor said, no, that's not advisable. It's too physical. And she knew a man who was the editor of the Observer newspaper. And she had a word with him. And um, he suggested what I should do and who I should speak to. And I, from, from that introduction, I went along and spoke to a gentleman at the British Federation of Master Printers. And they said, the job for you would be a printer's reader. So I started an apprenticeship as a printer's reader in 1957. I used to do the, I used to get the tea at break time, go over to cafe with a tray, come back with the tea with a couple of rolls that they might buy. And I used to get tips at the end of the week. They used to give me sixpence for looking after them through the week, getting their tea. And I used to run out to it, I used to buy, go out and buy the cigarettes and buy them cigarettes and I used to fetch them back and they used to give me threepence or a cigarette. Would you like one? And that's how I started smoking. They used to give you a cigarette. Had to wait a year until I was 16 and then start my six year apprenticeship. Uh, I was the youngest of about 20 apprentices uh, which is a very difficult time when you're, you're the youngest apprentice, you're the, the butt of all the, the jokes, the tricks, the humour. Uh, and you remain that way until another apprentice comes in who is then the junior apprentice and you can then start playing the tricks on him. Girls didn't have apprenticeships, girls had learnerships. We were not highly regarded, we were women. So uh, you had a learnership, and that was three years, and then you got the full, not you didn't get the full pay, you did a further two years experience before you got full pay. Um, and that was women's pay, not men's pay. I had to cycle to work because you couldn't afford to go by bus. 
um, just enough money to see me down the week. Uh, my mother subsidised me with about two shillings a day. As an apprentice, you were very much the boy. So you expected to do the work that other people didn't want to do. For example, my job in the reading room was to go and get work for the man with whom I worked. He was experienced, he was skilled, he was, he was long practice at the job. And as an apprentice, it was my job to watch what he did and to learn from him. It was hard, and at times it was very, very hard. Um, I was given a journeyman to oversee my work, who at times could be quite vicious. He was a big man and wasn't afraid to use his size to uh, put a lippy 15, 16 and 17 year old into place. And I went to day release education courses at print schools and things like that until I got my full technological certificate. There was a lot of young girls there and a lot of young boys, although it was only a small printing company. There was the machine room and there was the comps and there was the readers and we was the, on the ground floor on the finishing side of it. And um, yeah, we all used to go out after work and um, we was all very, very good friends actually. Now the tea was shared. The, tea, the, cup and the mug of tea was passed from A to B, to C, to D. It was passed all round and we all had a swig of tea. And that was our start in the mornings, every morning at work. And it makes comradeship. And, and gradually they, um, they introduced you to the type cases and you had to find out where all the letters were in the case um, because they were spaced out in, in an unusual area. Um, and you gradually learnt the trade. and had to learn which typefaces, what they all had different names and different sizes, and you had to learn it all. Um, the place was very, very old. The case racks were wooden, dusty, dirty, uh, and little mice like running over the cases at night and leaving deposits in with the type, which was quite nice, really. On my first day, I was introduced to a composing room and a case of type and I was given two composing sticks and a piece of copy and they said set away to your heart's content. Now I didn't know much about it of course but they gave me a little instruction and I carried on and I produced miles and miles of this stuff over a couple of days and then I thought they'd forgotten me. and. Uh, and came up and I thought, oh, now I see what it looks like. It's horrible. <laughs> there was mistakes all the way through it and all sorts of things wrong. When you become recognised as an apprentice, which is generally in your last two years, that you can do a journeyman's job, your rates of pay go up quite significantly. And that's when life started to get a wee bit easier. And then after six years, you became a journeyman. And most importantly, you went on to full wages. That was the best bit. We, we received our papers and came downstairs. And as we came downstairs, that's when the banging out started. And they all grabbed any, any piece of old metal that they could find, a stick or whatever it was, and Bang, bang, bang. It was customary for the man who finished his apprenticeship, or the boy in this case, to take all his friends for a drink. Uh, so what my father did was bought two bottles of whiskey. So when I went back to work in the afternoon, I had a drink with each of the 21 readers in the reading room, by which time I was quite ill. Just before 12 o'clock, the other apprentices come and get you, and uh, they take your clothes off of you. So all I had on was my swimming trunks and then they sat me on a, a, a chair, which they tied me to the chair, and then lifted me up and put me inside a, a truck. And then they tipped a, a dustbin full of rubbish over me, which was all liquids, uh, ink, tea, old tea slops, and anything that was, would make a mess. Uh, tipped that over me. 
so I was all messed up. And then they push you round the department and everyone uh, bangs something to make a loud noise. And then I was put in the lift, still in the, the uh, truck, and taken to the machine room where they did the same in the machine room. And then taken down into the warehouse to the ladies for them to have a good laugh. And then I was taken to um, Old Street Roundabout and um, tied to a lamppost in the middle of the road and left there. So very exciting. Then when, when the police took me back to the factory after a couple of hours, um, I cleaned up as much as I could and then I had to thank everyone by taking them for a drink. You can argue about it, it's not very nice. You get smothered in glue and uh, the apprentice got smothered in glue and paper shavings and God knows what and thrown about like and water poured over them and all this kind of stuff like, you know. You can argue it's pretty sort of primitive like, you know. Everyone joined the union in those days. It was what they called a closed shop. So everyone had to join the union. So I was happy. I didn't know much about unions. Um, until I joined it, but then I was very happy because the union looked after us. And the union used to have a facility where you could go up to the union house, which was like a big office, tell them your name and address and what you did and what you could do, and they had a great big long list there of opportunities. It's like going to a job agency. The trade union that we belong to was very um, important in people's lives. Um, it, it, not only in the sense that negotiated wages and uh, um, conditions, but also we organised the rotors. The, the unions would organise um, the whole working shift patterns for, for everybody, um, as well as looking after the, the, the jobs and, and the, the wages. They, they actually said who worked on what pages and they organised the whole process for the, for the management and the management were quite happy with that. It took a whole lot of worry away from them. The union, which I think was a wonderful thing, we had convalescent homes, you know, and, and, and I'm talking just before the National Health came in and there were convalescent homes. My union itself had five convalescent homes. We had sick pay schemes before we got really proper sick pay and that type of thing, that the union was there for the members. There was a sign from the cradle to the grave, the union will look after you. I got very much involved in the union. I became the shop steward. I was called the mother of the chapel, which meant the union representative. Um, and then in 1977, I was elected as a full-time officer of the union. So from 1977 onwards, my place of work was no longer in Fleet Street, it was at the union office. A chapel um, is uh, a print expression for the local branch, where, where you worked. So if you worked in Her Majesty's Station Office, that's a chapel. If you worked in a Daily Express, that's a chapel. It wasn't easy for women. It was very, very hard to get recognition that you, your work was every bit as equal to the work that any man did. And you were getting a lower rate of pay than the man sweeping the floor. And it wasn't right. And if you had a problem, you went to your union representative, you didn't automatically go to your manager, you went to your union representative uh, and told him about any problems you had and they would make arrangements for you. You, you didn't approach management. After my apprenticeship, I became a three-knife operator on a guillotine. It was called a cruise. And they used to call me the rebel with the cruise. As opposed to your normal job, you was allowed to work weekends on national newspapers. And that is how you normally got into a national newspaper, by working weekend shifts, as they used to call it, casual work. And I was a casual in Fleet Street on all the different newspapers. We used to get our call at one o'clock and they'd say, right, you're on the Telegraph tonight, or you're on the Daily Mirror, you're on the Express, you're on another newspaper. If you can imagine a city within a city, that was Fleet Street. 
There were public houses and restaurants and things like that that were constantly full. There was over 100,000 people worked in Fleet Street. So Fleet Street was a, a buzzing kind of place. You know, you could imagine there's 100,000 people work 24 hours a day, really. Loads and loads of people really working ever so hard, but also enjoying themselves as well. And lots of chattering and nattering and meeting up and what have you. Sometimes it was very hard, but it was a, I loved it. Absolutely, we all did. It was a lovely atmosphere. Fleet Street was a village. Everybody knew everybody else. Um, it was exciting. There was a real buzz. Every night was party night. That's why people tolerated the conditions, because of the comradeship and the fun. It made for very, very tight working relationships. It's a great big community, so what happened in the Times or the Sun was immediately felt in the other companies as well because everybody knew each other. Plus, people might do two, do two shifts in one newspaper and then two shifts in another newspaper, so everybody was interlinked. Oh, it was chaos. Lots and lots of drinking, it's always said about Fleet Street. And we had a chief sub um, who liked his gin. I think what, what I, the, the incident that I'm reminded of best was when um, women's equality was coming, was coming through more and bars weren't allowed to have discrimination against women. Um, there was a legendary bar on Fleet Street called Elvino's and after this legislation had gone through at five o'clock one afternoon um, was the first session in Elvino's where women were going to be able to walk up to the bar and order a drink. This must have been about 1982 or something. And various um, photographers were all standing outside Fleet Street, outside the Fleet Street branch of Elvino's, catching the queue. And there were lots and lots of women all determined to get in and become the first woman to order a drink at the Elvino's bar. When the pictures were coming in, they were all rushed straight up to um, the sun. And there, right at the front of the queue in these pictures, was our chief sub-editor, who had grey hair, standing there at five o'clock, waiting to get into Elvino's for his regular gin and tonic in the middle of the afternoon. <laughs> there was the, uh, the Daily Telegraph, the Daily Express, all had beautiful offices and a facade of uh, real places to be proud of. But uh, behind that, they were just like factories. It's a wonderful smell to go down into that, that machine room. You go downstairs into the dungeon, like. And it's all the spirits and the inks, it's a wonderful smell. It's dirty, because until someone f works out a way to print without ink, it's a dirty job. So you're getting ink on yourself all the time. Uh, you know, so there's certain dangers with that, because ink's corrosive. That is when the rollers start to spin. Th there'd be ink spraying, fine particles of ink spraying in the air. And you'd be breathing this in all night. So when you blew your nose when you went home, the mucus would be absolutely black. They used to make hats out of newspapers, fold them up so otherwise their hair would get all ink in them. So you could all see them in their overalls and their big white hats on. The sound, the sound was a little bit uh, unnerving. You had the roar of the press all the time. Vroom, vroom, vroom. And it was noisy. And all, all the print men used to wear the big, the big earphones. In, in the Observer where I was working, the paper used to come up through the floor. When it was running, these presses were just like bigger than this room. 
and you'd feel the floor vibrating with the paper coming through and everyone was, well, most of the old printers were deaf. The noise was absolutely horrendous. It was just like standing next to a runway. But I came in into the front of the building one day in, into the lift and they had priority so the lift went down instead of up to my floor and they were in full flow in the machine room. And as the doors opened, the sound and vibrations threw me to the back of the lift. I hadn't braced myself. I hadn't noticed the others were all bracing themselves. And you just didn't think sound and vibration could do that. It was manual. You were on your feet all day long. Uh, it was dirty. Uh, and it creates a different atmosphere from someone sitting in a, a collar and tie um, at a desk. We used to have uh, competitions within the composing room where you used to balance a mallet on your finger and walk around the room with the mallet and the, the manager had come up and asked you to get on with some work and you'd tell him that you couldn't because you were in a competition to balance a mallet. You never saw a fat compositor on a newspaper. They were always moving about very fast, um, perspiring in the heat. And of course there's a lot of dust and paper fly about. As paper gets cut, there's paper fly and ink fly about, so it's not a pleasant environment. The newspaper printing plate was made of lead. And what they found was if you continually reuse the lead, it became weak. And quite often we found that during the night, the plates would break up and they'd break up like a hand grenade going off. During my period up in Fleet Street, there was a mining dispute and a group of miners from Stoke-on-Trent came down and we took them down into the sun machine room. Now mining conditions were never good, they were appalling. And they turned round to us and said, how on earth can you work in these noisy, filthy conditions? And in the newspaper trade, there were deadlines for the paper to go to bed. So um, you had to meet the deadlines. I always remember that uh, it was very exciting uh, because, remember, you were trying to get a newspaper out for the next day. And you had trains and planes to catch. So it really was a race up until the, the time that all the pages were down. That feeling that you had you know, 24 hours to make a newspaper, you know, and the, the, the pressure I enjoyed, sometimes it was quite hair-raising. And generally speaking, the pressure got to people at times. You tried to keep the pressure off the people you see at the pressure point and you'd help, you try and help, because it didn't always happen. So we used to get some rather large arguments going on from time to time. I loved writing headlines. Um, I loved cutting copy, not because it was fun cutting other people's work, but because there was an art to getting stuff to fit in the page. In a sense, I've always regarded myself as a newspaper man rather than a journalist. That it was where you'd have a, just an empty frame with nothing in it. And bit by bit, as the evening went on, all different parts came and you just assembled it. It was like playing Lego, really. And then you'd um, just wait for the type to come through and, and gradually wait for the pictures, the blocks. Uh, they'd all go in and gradually there'd be adverts to go in at the bottom of the page or whatever. The copy for the pages would come down along with a journalist for each page who was called a stone sub. Then a compositor, or time hand as we were called, would be assigned to each page. In other words, you might go on a sports page, city, front or back. I, quite a lot of my job with, um, with the printers was known as stone subbing. Uh, the stone was a curious sort of table where once the words had been turned into metal, uh, and were being put in the page. The printer was on one side of it and there would be a sub-editor on the other side. Uh, the sub-editor isn't allowed to touch any of the metal. 
I would make up the story according to the death and I would, depth and I would say to him, I need six lines cut. He would look at the galley proof and he would say, lose that last paragraph. Or he might say, take this word off here and do this. And that was that. And the story would fit. The page would then be tightened into a spring-loaded chase, wheeled on a trolley to a man who would proof it on a press. And it would then go to the reader. They would check that. And according to how late the page was, uh, the head printer would be hovering in the background. And sometimes, if it was a bit late, he would just send the page through anyway before last minute corrections had been done. And there was always friction between the head sub-editor and the head printer over this. In other words, uh, Sometimes the story would just trail off halfway and you were left wondering who won the football match or whatever. And uh, it was always a bit of friction during the days of hot metal. We were supposed to get it off at half past seven. In all the 15 years I was there, I think we only did it once. Most times the editor kept it to late, um, which upset everybody. The foundry then had to work harder, making the flong. Um, that went downstairs and they were put onto machines for casting the curved plates and the number of plates come off you would not believe each page had well there were 48 units downstairs so you had to have 48 plates to start with then you ended up with half a dozen spare in each so there was masses and the lead well the lead bowl down the stairs from which it was, it was like a swimming pool really it was huge and very very hot so it was hot and it was noisy and they were all clamped onto machines and the 48 machines, when they started running, the noise was so terrible. I was a, uh, a machine minder's assistant, or labourer. So if you can think of a press, yeah? At one end's paper, at the other end comes out printed, yeah? I was the person who put the, the paper in, clean the machine, do the labouring. So I was a printer's labourer uh, doing the work. So the printer, his job is to make sure what comes out the end is right. That's his job. My job was to keep the machine going, keep it fed. Sometimes in a day, lift 15 tonne of paper. In a day, you know, not all at once, obviously. <laughs> at the end of the day, you had a, a page and you could look at it and you say, that was my page, I did that, when you saw it in the paper the next day. Mr Murdoch said he'd make us best paid people in Fleet Street if we could get a million copies out a night. And during my time there, we got it up to two million. And by the time I got to the end of my 15 years, we got it up to three and a third million. Now that was never been matched anywhere in the world. That was what you call good crews, loyal crews. Wapping's quite a simple thing. What happened at Wapping was one of the employers, Murdoch, who you no doubt you've heard of, decided that they'd be much more profitable if they could cut wages and make people work longer. 
That's what whopping was about. It wasn't about technology, it was about people having their wages cut and working longer. With the connivance of the government and the police. So the deal was that the Sun, or Murdoch's newspapers, would support Margaret Thatcher. And the other side of the agreement was that Thatcher would put in anti-union legislation that would allow him and give him the facilities to dump a workforce, which he exploited. He was allowed to have five newspapers at the same time, because it's a very powerful tool, a newspaper. So you might ask, well, why was that allowed to happen? Well, very much because he had friends in high places. I just think he wanted to employ people that wasn't in the union. I think he, he felt that um, he could offer them um, less terms and conditions, less holiday and certainly less pay. Now Rupert Murdoch felt here was a chance that combined with changes in law he could do all sorts of naughty things to get us thrown out of work without paying us redundancy pay and things like that. So he said, well, how can we get rid of them? And he took legal advice and the legal said, well, make them go out on strike. Make them go out on strike. And then when they're out on strike, sack them. And that was his tactic. And he said to us, well, I'm gonna set up a new firm in Wapping and you can come but you'd have to come on my terms, which would mean no union membership, you would have a fixed rate of pay, which I would determine, you'd have no rights to complain about anything, in fact you'd have no rights at all, and by the way, half of you won't be required. And instead of uh, negotiating and making it a civilised way of uh, changing people's working, he found it easier just to sack everyone and start again with, uh, with people who were new. Um, the plant at Wapping had already been bought and it was going up and we knew that because we'd been involved with it and lots of the union representatives had been to the site to recommend to the management the positioning of the machines and how many people to be employed and so on. And then the management stopped. They, through, if you like, a cloak of secrecy over everything, and they wouldn't talk to the union at, at all. They wouldn't talk to any of the workers, they wouldn't talk to any of the union reps. Um, and so we became very suspicious. We knew that something nasty was going on, but we didn't know what. And then we started to hear about the management recruiting new workers in different places around the country. Eric Hammond, he'd been dealing with him about putting union members into whopping from the electricians union and he was recruiting them all down in Portsmouth. Brought up to London by coach and put into the whopping plant. At one point, various of my colleagues um, would disappear with what was known, became known as whopping cough oh, they're off sick, they've got whopping cough. And what that meant was they were being trained down in whopping to do work on the new technology. And we were talking in, our, in the car, driving home from work, and we were saying, oh, well, they'll have to do something because they're negotiating. And the next morning, he just sacked everybody. And we, we thought there was gonna be some negotiations and a settlement was gonna happen and just out of the blue, everyone got sacked. In my view, they'd engineered the strike with the printers um, in order that they could sack the printers and then move everybody in. And I said I wasn't going along with that. Um, there was a vote among the journalists on the Friday evening uh, and they voted overwhelmingly to get on the bus and go to Wapping. And I think eight journalists at The Sun refused and I was one of them. The journalists' union officially supported the printers, which I was very pleased that they, they did. You know, we, we used to go down to um, Wapping every um, Wednesday night and every Saturday night. And there used to be 
big, big crowds there because we were fighting to get our jobs back. And if we couldn't get our jobs back, then at least let, let us have our redundancy. My involvement was going up to just show solidarity, if you like, with the workers from News International. In other words, to let them know we were on their side. And there were thousands and thousands of pickets. So um, I would help organise the marches and I would make all the arrangements. And we had a big march from Scotland uh, to London and uh, helping with their legal cases and their unemployment benefit cases. And just trying generally to help people live their lives so that they were able to feed themselves and their families. I remember attending attending a meeting um, and um, when we left I was I was driving um, and I had my daughter and my sister-in-law and we came along the embankment on our way home and what would come in the opposite direction <laughs> but two coaches full of scabs we referred to them as scabs they were, they were the people who were being brought up from the WTPU union from Portsmouth this was a case of 95 red, red rags to three little bulls in one car. And I went berserk. We were at the traffic lights. I went berserk. My daughter went berserk. We wound down the windows and we shrieked out of the car, scabs, 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 because that was what people did on a Saturday night at Wapping. We'd go down there and we'd take food parcels down for them because they wasn't earning no money, so you'd, you'd take food parcels down so they could take home. So they, they got families with children. They wasn't earning any money. That, the union used to give them some money. And it was very difficult for the union to place everyone in a job. So there were times when some of us didn't have a job to go to. And so there was a lot of suffering. There was a lot of times when we couldn't buy enough food we didn't have enough money to pay the bills. What we used to do was to go down to Wapping and just stand opposite Murdoch's new plant, his new offices, where the new paper was coming out. And we would just be showing our protest. And um, we weren't allowed to go too near. But uh, when the lorries came out, everyone would shout jeering things at them, like scab and whatever. And they used to sort of try and attack the lorries or throw an eggs at the windscreens of lorries because if you throw an egg at the windscreen and the windscreen wipers won't clear it just make it smooth so all the big lorries was coming out of what from the dawn newspapers everybody would stand there and throw eggs at them. Actually, what they would do the police would clear a way for the, for the uh, newspapers to come out and uh, um, then they'd fly out at 50 60 mile an hour and if you was in the way well that's bad that's tough luck on you in fact one guy was killed well, he wasn't a picket, he was just walking down, down the street and he got hit by a lorry going at 50 mile an hour. Um, I witnessed brutality from the police, awful brutality. Horses charging into people, people nearly going under lorries, pickets charging at the police. I witnessed pickets throwing um, missiles at the police. So all in all, it wasn't a very pleasant time for either side. But this particular, I think it was a Saturday night, and Murdoch's aim was obviously to get his papers out and get them out on time, but um, he called in the riot police to help him. So we'd be talking to the police one time, and then there were like suddenly out of all these vans, much smaller kind of people got out. They seemed to be much smaller somehow, but they were hidden and they had, their faces were hidden. They had these, they looked very scary. And they had like these big, strong um, riot shields in front of them. And they lined up across the highway. And um, we were very curious. This is the first time I saw this. But the next thing, they were charging at us. So we ran, it was quite terrifying. So we don't know, for example, we, there was people on the picket line on the, amongst the coppers who were shorter than police. And we thought, well, who are these people? And I'm pretty certain, we're all pretty certain, it was army. They got army personnel there, all kinds of people. Police horses are chosen for their training and size. They're almost Sherman tank-like in proportions. They are massive. They're much, much bigger when you're standing next to them. 
And on the picket line, a police horse two feet away, or rows of police horses, with six foot policemen on the back of them anyway, it was like just confronting an army, a medieval army. And they were quite indiscriminate with baton attacks and riding big horses into crowds of defenceless people. I mean, I was frightened a lot of times. I don't mind admitting it to anybody. As they say in that colloquial, my bottle dropped out plenty of times at Wapping. One of the strangest things I saw um, was that there was a line of policemen on horseback uh, just standing there on their, the horses were just standing there and uh, nothing was happening. And then along came a man playing bagpipes and the horses really hated the noise of the bagpipes and the policeman had to lead all the horses away just for one man with bagpipes. So not many people know that if you want to get rid of a policeman on a horse, you just got to play bagpipes and he'll go away. Well, I remember people being beaten up by the police and that was really shocking. Um, I remember running myself um, and the police chasing us with riot shields and we ran towards a pub and the pub publican opened, because he was a local person, he opened his door and let us all in and then bolted the door against the police. And I think that's when it dawned on me that, that, that actually we were the good guys. You know, we were, we were like the cops, not the robbers, if you know what I mean. Yeah, they had, there was a, 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 a whopping residence group that came on marches with us because they objected. What happened was the coppers used to close off the street. So if you was a resident, you couldn't get home. You know, it's reminiscent of a police state. You can't do this, you can't do that, you can't go there, you can't do this. Argue with them, you'll get arrested. I'm asking you, Inspector, why can't we walk down this particular street? What's the reason? I'd like a reason publicly why we can't walk down this street. A colleague of mine who was arrested for asking a question, I will never forget that, never. And he asked, why was he arresting the, the chap he was putting in the van? He didn't do anything. The lies, he was drunk and disorderly, resisted arrest. <laughs> I thought, I don't believe this is happening. A jury at the Old Bailey has been told that two Metropolitan Police officers concocted evidence against the demonstrator after riots at the Wapping newspaper plant four years ago. These pictures were taken by a BBC cameraman and shown uncut to the jury. They were told Mr Johnson is the man seen in front of the police line. There was no lump of concrete, nothing was thrown. The video the court heard bears no resemblance to the incident described by the two officers. They'd given evidence that he was kicking and struggling when dragged behind police lines. And when accused of throwing the concrete, said, good, I hope it hurts. Mr Ainley, prosecuting, said the two policemen quite deliberately made up and concocted the case against David Johnson. It was aimed entirely at securing his conviction for an offence of which he was innocent. I was arrested five, six times. and They were doing it directly to intimidate me, make me scared, make me wonder, make me worry was they said I had pushed a megaphone into the face of a police officer, which I'd never done. And when we had the trial, they just simply lied, the police. They said he'd put me to prison for one year with eight months suspended. I saw one night, um, there's an old churchyard there and I saw one night a um, policeman picking up these railings from the grass. They'd been their donkeys, they were rusty. So I'm picking up the railings and taking them away. The next day on the television, there was um, a police officer who looked a bit like Tony Blackburn at the time, I can't remember his name. Um, and he's saying, look what my men had thrown at them. Well, it, it didn't happen. Um, and on one night, we had television cameras there with a, a lady reporter who'd been to every murderous place in the world reporting, Kate Aidy. And the first time she gets hurt, she gets hurt at Wapping. The police hit the cameras, hit her, hit everybody. And one of the things about Wapping, it started out as a dispute about jobs. But what the police say is, 
we hit you because you're here. If you weren't here, we wouldn't hit you. And then the question becomes, do you back down to this intimidation? And I'm proud of the fact we didn't at Wapping. I'm proud of the fact of what I've done at Wapping and I'm proud of the people I stood on the picket line with because we was under a lot of pressure. It was frightening and our, um, we kept it up for a year. But all of the people who'd been sacked were not reinstated. Murdoch didn't re-employ them. And most of them never worked in the industry again because their, the jobs just simply weren't available any longer. It was very tragic for people. They lost, many people lost their homes because they couldn't afford to pay their rent or their mortgages. And some people um, even lost their lives. You know at Christmas time when you put paper hats on and you write who you are and you've got to say who am I? Well, he made me Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> no, <laughs> that wasn't best place. <laughs> Businessman. He's a businessman of his time. He saw his opportunity and took it. Uh, but if he was on fire, I'd dial 998. The fallout from Wapping was that we ultimately lost all our jobs. All of us lost our jobs. And it was the end of Fleet Street because very quickly other companies followed Murdoch's example. Not in the same way, not with the same ruthlessness, not with the same deceit, and not with the same people pushing him along, lawyers and so on, who'd set up the print workers to be sacked. Once uh, Wapping had got up and running on the ATEX system, every other newspaper in Fleet Street jumped on the bandwagon. Uh, where I worked at The Guardian, they were very good. They decided they would retrain everybody. Well, not everybody, but they would retrain a lot of people. Um, and they were kindly to the people who had to go. They paid them good redundancy money. Um, so it was much more a civilised way of uh, carrying on. And the thing that really makes one angry, even 30 years later, is the fact that we did such a lot for him. Because without the workers, Murdoch could not have got any of the money that would have made him a worldwide media mogul he is today. He seems to have forgotten entirely that it wasn't just his newspaper, it was the workers' newspaper. And that was an attitude that was with us from day one. When you entered print and you produced the job, you produced it as if it were your own. In other words, the standards required were the very highest, the standards you would want if it was your paper, if it was your magazine, your book or your whatever. And Murdoch completely broke that link. So today there isn't the same attitude in relation to most things that are printed. Whilst there was many sad aspects to the change of the new technology, to the new technology from the old technology. My word, the conditions were so much better. Forget six year apprenticeships, a few weeks, someone who's bright on a Mac, they're churning out beautiful stuff. There's no doubt about that. So that is how it affected the industry. It shut down hundreds and hundreds of printers. Desktop publishing became the norm. So really the printing industry just ceased to exist because everyone was capable, if you like, of printing their own newspaper. Even church magazines become works of art. I'd seen the very early typesetting and all the rest of it that hadn't changed much in four or five hundred years. And later I was introduced to the new way of working, the way in which I still work today, which was with computers, which is soulless, but very quick, and very, very profitable. The strike was not about technology. Printing, the printed word, from its inception, with the Gutenberg Press in 1480, something like that anyway, print is high technology. The printed word is high technology. It was, it is, and it always will be. So the arguments about technology, technology is always changing, is how we utilise that technology. And for whose benefit? That's the argument about technology. The big change with the new technology 
was that printing the pages became a lot cheaper. You could do a lot more pages and thus you had a lot more advertising space that you could sell. And that was the key. The management had looked at the technology and said, we can make an awful lot of money out of this and we're going to keep all of the money. And it's not going in workers' wages. And in a sense, that's almost what history is about. <laughs> The benefits of the new technology goes to those who own it, not those who work it. Well, I think statistically it's a reportable fact that they're one of the highest sections of um, criminality in the country. Newspaper bosses, they have very dubious things. We had Maxwell, um, Murdoch, who's got a lot of people who seem to have got up to funny things with telephones. A um, bloke called Conrad Black at the Telegraph, who seems to have been a guest of Her Majesty at some point. So I miss the camaraderie, you know, where people, the people you see in, are um, every day and there's a, a banter and a camaraderie. I miss that. And I missed it from, from when I stopped working in the print, which was after the strike. You know, I became a cab driver, but a cab driver, you don't meet anybody, you, don't, you work on your own. You know, so I, I do miss that, yeah. When the dispute finished, I found, it, I found it too emotional to come up to Fleet Street. And I didn't come up here for around about eight years. I can do it now. I can do it now. I still, I've, I've got lots of thoughts, lots and lots of happy memories. But it's still tinged with a lot of sadness. A lot of sadness. But I wouldn't have missed any of the things I've done for anything. Really wouldn't.